Hey, Hoagland, H-O-A-G-L-U-N-D, your State Farm agent in Champlin. Hey, Minnesota sports fans. This is your local State Farm agent, Tony Hoagland. I need you all to ask yourselves this question. If you're in an at-fault car accident and you are sued for $700,000, how much of that $700,000 will my current insurance company pay? If you are unsure or can't answer all $700,000, you need to give us a call. State Farm has been number one in car insurance since World War II and number one in homeowners insurance since 1964. For a no-obligation review of your current policies, call us at 763-421-4900 or check out our website at www.champlininsurance.com. All right, so tell us the mound visit story. <laughs> this, you have to know the characters involved first. First and foremost, it's Gene Mock, one of my favorite characters in the game. And you know what? We're going to spend, I'd like to spend an entire podcast or most of one sometime just talking about Gene. We can do that. And some Gene stories. I'd like for people to understand or, or, or get a sense of the complexity and the enigma and... And the wonderfulness of that guy, but um, well, anyway. you know, there, there will be a week in this off season where just not much is happening, and we can just do a, a stories, you know, segment. Yeah, I think a mock stories deal and and just some mock reflections would be good. But in any event, major players in this in this story: Gene Mock, uh, Dave Goltz, starting pitcher for uh, for us, one of the fifty uh, greatest twins, voted that uh, not long ago. Um, Bobby Randall, the second baseman, uh, with whom I made a boatload of double plays, he and Rob Wilfong, uh, as my double play uh, partners at second base for uh, a few years, and we made an awful lot of double plays, and Bobby was, Bobby was a, a terrific defensive second baseman, and Don Baylor is in this story Good. as well. So here's the scenario, and I'm going to apologize in advance. I don't remember what it was that set Gene off. We are playing the Oakland A's, this is in 1976, when or 77, when seven, nah, one of those two years, when Baylor, because Baylor had been with Orioles and then A's and then Angels, and it all is running together. But I think it was 77, he was with the Oakland A's. And the inning just went to total hell. And I don't remember what happened, but Gene, uh, the inning was breaking down and the umpires made a bad call. What, some umpire made a bad call. And Gene went, crazy. I mean, he just, he's arguing. And what happens with, with managers, especially good and smart managers, is they start arguing with an umpire about something, and the umpire will say something really stupid. <laughs> or they'll say something really kind of offensive. And I don't mean profane, or I don't mean, I don't mean personal, but just something that will make so little sense or be such an indication of arrogance. So you got a manager that's volatile, that knows the game, that knows he's right, and you got an umpire that says some A, stupid, or B, uh, arrogant, and then they go crazy. And so Gene is going absolutely nuts. Meanwhile, uh, Don Baylor had been involved in the inning. He's on second base. Now, everybody knows, I think, most people know about Don Baylor. You know, 6'3", 230 pounds. There's not an ounce of fat on him, especially at that point in time in, in his career. And he had the reputation of not being af- afraid to brawl, yeah. right? I mean, he was devastating in a team fight, devastating. I've seen, I've seen him. <laughs> <laughs> so he's on second base. Gene's arguing with, I think, I think the home plate umpire, but I, I don't remember whether it's home plate or third base, one of them. Might have been third base, arguing. Then the uh, home plate umpire, I think, is the crew chief, and he comes out to say, that's enough, Gene, you've got to go now. Now Gene gets, gets mad at him, he starts, he starts yelling, and they get a big to-do because obviously the guy said something either A, stupid, or B, arrogant. And, and now Gene is getting madder and madder and madder. And he goes now, he won't get off the field. He goes to the second base umpire to plead his case and starts arguing with him. And then he goes to the first base umpire. And he's, he's just making it. And then he, for the cycle. He's arguing, arguing for, for the, the cycle. cycle. And he's arguing for the cycle. And he, he, just because he's mad. And he wants every one of the umpires on there to get a dose of it, right? Just 
and this has gone on for 15, 20 minutes. I mean, that's a long time. And it goes back to the uh, home plate umpire, and he starts, he starts yelling him, you know, with and at him again. Finally, they want him to get off the field. All four umpires are, and he, and he said, he pushes them all out of the side. He says, I'm going to talk to my pitcher. So now he comes out to the mound. And there's no other reason. No, there's nothing he needs to tell Dave Goltz. He just didn't want to get off the field, and he's just so angry, he's not going. And he comes up on, he calls the, uh, the uh, infielders in. And we come in there, and knowing Gene the way I do, I know that he wants to fight. I can look at him, I've seen it, he wants to fight. And Gene was a brawler too. I mean, Gene is not, he, he, would, he, he would fight King Kong on a ladder if he, if he had a, a, a reason to. And, and so I get to the mound and I go, uh-oh, Gene wants to fight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know what's going to happen here. So Gene, Gene looks at Dave Goltz, points his finger, he says, listen here, I want one of you guys, and he points to me and Bobby Randall back and forth. He says, one of you guys, to put on a pickoff play at second base. And when you get the ball, whoever it is, I want you to take the ball, and I want you to slam it into the head of the guy on second, <laughs> uh, the runner. Right? You got it? So he, he turns around and walks back, and Bobby and I turn around, and his bailer out there, and we're going, oh, oh no. man. <laughs> Because, you know, if we do that, it is going to be, uh, it, it, I mean, it might be the, the I mean, I'm th- I go back up and say, this you. could be the end of me. Yeah. So, and the beauty of it was, now Dave Goles turns around and walks a bit to the back, behind the road, back of the mound, and he starts rubbing up the ball with this canary eating <laughs> grin on his face, looking back and forth at me and Bobby Reynolds going, okay, who's going to give me the side? He's just looking for the side, just standing there, rubbing up the ball, grinning waiting to see who's going to put on the sign. And this whole thing flashed it through my head in about three seconds. I go, I'm going to fight somebody. Okay, I'd rather, I'd rather it was Gene. <laughs> and I put... <laughs> and Goltz is looking at me, and I just I put my hands on my knees and put my head down and pretending like I was kicking uh, pebbles out of the way and stuff. And I looked over Bobby out of the corner of my eye. Bobby's not doing anything. Finally, Goltz, Goltz uh, gives up, goes back to the mound. We finish the inning... And I go in prepared to get whatever from Gene. And by that time, I think he had calmed down enough to think, okay, I don't want my shorts not being killed on the field here. It's, this is, it, it, I'm not going to say anything. Else. That's awesome. You Baylor wanted- and I, as you know, became, became great friends right. when we, uh, after that. We played against each other a long time and then played together on the Yankees for a couple of years and, and, uh, and became great friends. I told him about that story. We laughed about, about that. Ultimately, you know, Donnie, of course, came back and helped us win the World Series in 87. But anyway, that was one of my more memorable mound visits. I don't know if I've ever told you this, but, you know, I covered, I, when I was at the University of Missouri, I would sometimes get to go over and do some Royals or some Cardinals stories, you know, just as a, a kid, just kind of learn his way. But the first Major League ball player I ever talked to when I was actually working for a living I was helping out some writers in, in, at a Rangers game, and I went down, and B- Baylor had a big hit or something like that. And so I walked up. My first you know, professional interview of a ball player was Don Baylor. And he, you know, I asked him a question, and he gave me like the, just the most stiff-arm cliche. You know, he's just like, uh, we take him one at a time, kid, something like that. Just like, okay, you're a, you're a punk. You're like 23 years old. You know, you look like you're 14. I'm just going to blow you off. And, and then I asked another question, and he said, and he said Oh, what are you going to ask me next? You know, what pitch was I, was I looking for that pitch or something like that? You know, just another. And then I asked him third question, and he kind of looked at me and went, and he gave me like this great answer. It was like he, he, he figured out that I wasn't looking for just the blow-off soundbite stupid quote, and he was fantastic. It, yeah. was, it was kind of a favorite memory of mine. Of yeah, Donald. he's he, he just really, really good. And just to punctuate the brawler part, um, you know, I'd seen him in – uh, in bench clearing brawls before, and you didn't want to be anywhere near uh, near him. And uh, a left-handed pitcher named Rick Waits found out about uh, about that. What time they uh, the Angels and Cleveland Waits was pitching for the for Cleveland, and and Donnie's out there with the Angels, and they get in a in a in a brawl, and it finally and, and Don's just beating on people, you know, just everywhere he turns. <laughs> And so now now it, yeah, exactly. And now they're walking off the field. It it finally gets calmed down and everybody's okay. It's it's over now. And they're walking off the field. And, and for some reason, 
Waits and Baylor are kind of walking somewhat close to each other as they as they leave, you know, out behind the mound. And for some stupid reason, and I know Rick Waits, we I played uh, with him in the you know, minor leagues in, in Texas, and uh, he's just a really nice, mild-mannered guy, kind of a goofy left-hander. And for some reason, his goofiness got the better of him. He's walking off near Baylor, and he turns to Baylor, obviously just trying to make a joke, and he says, you want a piece of me? Oh and Baylor God. goes, boom, and, oh, knocked, and no. knocked him out. Oh, <laughs> <It's> just, no. <laughs> I mean, that was his answer. It wasn't a yes or no. It was a boom. Weights goes down. So now everything starts again. They get it cleared off. So the media comes in to uh, the Cleveland locker room afterwards. They go right up to Weights and goes, what, what happened? What were you doing? He goes, well, I was just making a joke. I heard he was a fine Christian man. I, I just didn't, I, I, I didn't, I didn't expect anything. You know, I wasn't, didn't mean anything. So now the, the media goes back over to Baylor and says, well, wait, said that he heard you were a fine Christian man. And Baylor, he stopped him and goes, I am a fine Christian man. But when we've just been in a fight and someone asks if they want a piece of me, I take that as a, as an invitation. <laughs> I also remember I was living in Baltimore and Baylor was a rookie for the Orioles. I remember seeing him in a baseball uniform and going, that's not what baseball players yeah, look no. like. Yeah, that's, uh, that looks more like a, uh, like a Kurt, uh, Kurt, or Kurt Brown middle line. Yeah, yes. or like, looked more like a, uh, a tad more compact Anthony Barr. Yes. I mean, it's just, exactly. or uh, he, he was the baseball equivalent, equivalent of Daniil Hunter. Yes, that's about right. Um, let's, uh, let's do a couple of Twitter questions that are pretty topical. We'll remind, remind everybody that TalkNorth.com has grown a lot. I think we're up to about 180,000 listens over the last month or something. We've grown just by tremendous uh, leaps and bounds. Uh, we've had a lot of advertisers stick with us. This is a good time to start advertising with this program or the network in general. Again, reach us at TalkNorthPodcast at gmail.com. Twitter questions. The first is from Paul uh, in the previous episode, Roy mentioned that there's a huge gap between AAA and the big leagues. We'd like to hear a discussion of this. It seems to indicate there's not enough good talent for all big league teams. That's exactly right. That's the reason uh, why there is the gap. I mean, if you, if you think about there being 30 major league teams and you look at the rosters of those teams, anybody, not anybody, Almost everybody that should be in the big leagues is in the big leagues, right? Almost yeah. everybody. Because if you should be in the big leagues, you look around at every roster of 25 guys and you go, well, if he should be in the big leagues, then maybe he should not be, mm-hmm. right? And so we're going to make that switch. Uh, we're going to do something different, right? And, and that's, that's basically the answer. The, uh, the, the talent pool has thinned out uh, to the degree. And I think... For the longest time, baseball struggling with getting the the really great athletes uh, had been for a while. It's turning her back around. I mean, just you know, guys like Byron Buxton, uh, you know, are are coming back to baseball. You know, Mike Trout. Uh, it, you'd look at those guys and say, "Could can we imagine them playing another sport?" Well, yeah, we absolutely absolutely could. Or just being interested in another sport enough to not give baseball a chance, and maybe they don't go on to play. You know, in the NFL, or, or but it's they just weren't interested in baseball because they were playing these other things, right? right? And more more guys are more good athletes are playing baseball, it seems. So that's that could that could alleviate the, the or narrow the gap a little bit over time. But as of this point, uh, that's that's the situation. And and again, just to. You know, to reiterate, one of the best examples is a, is a guy like um, uh, Jose Barrios, mm-hmm. you know, who just, who, you talk about in the big leagues being able to pitch around and through a lineup that has a weak DH and a, and a ninth hitter. You know, think about AAA. I mean, how many guys are in that lineup uh, that can really hurt Jose Barrios? One, one or two, or two yeah. on every team. So he, he keeps the ball in the ballpark with those guys and punches out everybody else, and he looks like he, he should be ready. He comes up here, and it's, it's a different deal. Now you've got six or seven guys, major league hitters, that you can't – you've got to pitch to – you've got to pitch to five of them, you know, at some point in time. And, and uh, so that's uh, – that, that's an, and, and the Byron Buxton tear up AAA – and then come up here and struggle is is another is another example. I mean, how many big league pitchers, do you, starting pitchers, do you see, or relief pitchers do you see? One on a team, maybe two, in AAA, and and you see a 
pile of them up here in the big leagues. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, from my, Matthew Cryer, I hope I'm getting your guys' names right. Uh, we do appreciate the questions. From what you, you can tell, is there any sort of plan that's being executed this offseason by Falvey and Levine when the only free agent signings so far have been a couple one-year deals? 